good morning, church. Good to be here with you this morning. It's been a uh, busy weekend for us in the board. You guys remember we were uh, out this week at a retreat out in Pincher Creek. The drive out to Pincher Creek was very nice. I'd never driven that highway before, so I got to see all those windmills there. That was spectacular as well. Uh, The board was out there on Friday night, and then uh, for Saturday morning, the lead team joined us there. We had a great time of uh, discussing, praying, looking into the scriptures, listening to what God would have for us out there. It was tiring, but it was spectacular. So thank you so much for praying. We could feel your intercession out there. And I will have more of an update for you next week. We have some work we need to do with this, but it was a very valuable time. But one of the things that we noticed out there, and we noted uh, in our time, is that we serve an action-oriented church. Uh, Myron preached a few weeks ago about uh, local mission, and he brought up the need at our local Salvation Army for furniture. They had an empty warehouse. They had like one uh, love seat there. Well, it took just a couple of weeks of you guys in action there to fill this whole thing up. And Myron went over to talk to the new director there, and she already knew who he was because we filled their warehouse with furniture. So great job, church. I love being part of a church that responds to need like that. I'm also encouraged about the response to the Hearing God seminar. It was spectacular to see over 300 people show up to this. Jeremy and I thought maybe we'd get 100, but 300 is spectacular. And Jeremy is doing a lot of teaching here. He taught with his wife this last week on Wednesday morning. He taught with me on Wednesday afternoon. And then he taught with Luke Rafuse, our uh, young adults, on Thursday evening. And the only one he didn't teach uh, was the one our, uh, our high school students are doing Uh, in the high school ministry there. So he's doing a great job with that. But more exciting to note is that we are, as a church, learning how to hear the voice of God. And this is going to pay huge dividends for our church, and I'm excited about this. If we learn how to hear the voice of God and obey, uh, we will be able to worship God better. We will love each other better. And we will be able to reach out and serve each other or serve others outside this church more sacrificially. And then we will have tools that will we be will be able to disciple other people in this, whether it's our kids or our grandkids or the people that God gives us the opportunity to lead them across the line of faith. Now, these are discipleship tools. May God continue to guide us here. I'm just excited about what He has for us in the future. So keep your Bibles open there uh, today to 1 Timothy, uh, sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to be walking through this. And uh, may I say here that you should always come uh, to the services here with a Bible. Okay, I don't care if it's an electronic version or if it's actually a physical copy of the Bible or if you bring your own handwritten version. That's fine as well. Just bring something along with you here so that we can look at this. And the other thing that you might want to consider, I'm not ready to mandate this yet, but is bringing a journal along. Because if we believe that God speaks to us, God might have something to say to you while we're speaking or while, you know, you're singing songs. It might be good for you to scratch it down. You know, not, not imperative, but it might be a good thing to do. So think about that. Uh, Last year, I felt challenged by God uh, right at the beginning of the year. So actually at the end of 2017, I was thinking, God, what do you have for me in 2018 for my relationship with you? And God prompted me pretty specifically. He said uh, to me, I felt felt him doing this, Jeff, I want you to read through my word completely. And I want you to read through it in three months. So I said, all right, God, I'll do this. And I signed up, you know, on the Bible app there for the Bible project, read through the Bible in the year. And I said, you know, if I do three or four of these a day, I'll be able to read through it in three months. And so I started on this journey there. And as I was reading through this, I just felt God put his arms around me. And, you know, just hug me. He was just showing me his love. Every day I was reading this, he was just showing himself to me. 
And I was underlining and I was highlighting and I was filling my journal with thoughts. And I just spent some time actually this last week just reading what God was speaking to me during that time. And it was just amazing. I felt close to him. And honestly, at that time, it was really the only thing that was going well in my life. I was unsatisfied at my job. Janelle was really sick. A couple of my kids were struggling pretty hard. Uh, My dad actually passed away suddenly from a heart attack at the end of January, in the middle of that. Right the night before we had his funeral, I got T-boned in an intersection. Uh, I woke up the day after uh, his memorial service and had the worst flu of my life. I was in bed for a week. And there are other things I don't have time really to mention. But in the midst of all this, as I was reading through the scriptures there, I just felt God's arms come around me, just telling me that he loved me and he cared about me. He was speaking to me, and it was amazing. This is my heavenly Father speaking to my heart. God still speaks to us today, and he speaks through this book. The Bible is the foundation of how we know God. This book is the inspired, inerrant Word of God. We have a doctrinal statement that's part of our family of churches here in the Evangelical Free Church of Canada that I want to read through here. This is what we believe about the Bible. We believe that God has spoken in the Scriptures, both Old and New Testaments, through the words of human authors as the verbally inspired Word of God. The Bible is without error in the original writings, the complete revelation of his will for salvation, and the ultimate authority by which every realm of human knowledge and endeavor should be judged. Therefore, it is to be believed in all that it teaches, obeyed in all that it requires, and trusted in all that it promises. Now, that's a doctrinal statement there. But as we go about trying to hear the voice of God It is true that God speaks through his word. The Bible is God's voice to us. The big idea of this message is this. The Bible is the foundation of how we know God. If you want to hear the voice of God, read the Bible. If you want to hear God's voice, open up his word and start to read it. This is... The boundary, if you will. This is the fence. This is the truth. This is inerrant. This is God speaking to us. There are times that God will speak to us and prompt us to do various other things, maybe that don't appear exactly in here, but if they're outside of the bounds of what's written in here, they're outside of God's word. This is our boundary in this. And the Bible itself points to Jesus. So we look in our passage here in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14. It says this, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. Paul is writing this to Timothy. Because you know those from whom you have learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, Timothy grew up with a Jewish mother, and it was the Jewish parents' responsibility to teach and instruct their kids from the age of five in the Holy Scriptures. So Timothy had been taught this from the age of five. And Paul urges Timothy to trust what he has learned, to trust the Holy Scriptures. The Bible, he says here, is able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The Bible is essentially, he says, a salvation handbook. Its overarching purpose is to teach. Now, it's not to teach just facts. It's not to teach the facts about science or English or history or things like that. The main purpose of this book is to teach about salvation. The whole Bible unfolds God's divine strategy, his divine plan, his divine play, however you want to say, for salvation. Man is created in God's image, it says. And through his fall, through his disobedience, falls under sin and judgment. 
speaks about God's continuing to love us in spite of our rebellion. And God's plan was to save us through his covenant of grace with his chosen people, culminating in Christ, the coming of Jesus as the Savior who came to die to bear our sin, who conquered sin when he was raised from the dead and he was exalted to heaven and sent to us the Holy Spirit who comes and rescues us from our bondage to sin and our bondage to death so that we can know the liberty of God's freedom and we can become his children. None of this would be known apart from the Bible. Our doctrinal statement says this, the complete revelation of his will for salvation. More particularly, the Bible, if you want to sum it up, is a book about Jesus, who he is and what he does. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament that Jesus is promised. He's foreshadowed. It foretells us that he's coming. The Gospels speak of Jesus coming, walking on this earth, teaching, and then dying on the cross and coming back to life. The Acts of the Apostle tell about how that message started out at the Church of Jerusalem and systemically it went out and spread around the world. The epistles or the letters are from the apostles writing to the church, telling them how they should enact this in their lives. And then the book of Revelation shows Christ sharing the throne with God and an anticipation of him coming again in salvation and judgment where all things will be made right. This is the comprehensive portrait of Jesus Christ here in the scriptures in order that by faith we may be saved through him. This is the scriptures. Or you could sum it up a little simply in one phrase here from one of my professors at school. He said, God created mankind in order to love them. But we all rejected his love, so God sent his son to bear our sins on the cross in order that by believing in a sacrificial atonement, we might have life. It's a powerful phrase. This sums up the entirety of the Bible. If somebody comes and asks you, what is the Bible about, and you mention this phrase, that would sum it up good. So you should memorize this phrase or something like it. That's your 10 seconds of what the Bible is all about. God is revealing himself to you through his word. This is the voice of God speaking to you the biography of God. When you open the word of God, you should hear his voice speaking these words. That's what the Bible is. The Bible shows us salvation through Jesus. John 1.1, 1, 1. in the beginning was the word. In the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God, and the word was God. That's what the Bible is about. Paul goes on. Right at the beginning of verse 16, he says this, all scripture is God-breathed. The Bible is God-breathed. All right, this is an incredible statement. I have to, have to stop us here. After this word, God-breathed. It, it, it's actually a made-up word. Okay, Paul had to make this up to bring it across what he was saying. Put these two words, these two Greek words of God and breath together so that we could get a sense of what is going on here. And this is awesome. The scripture was breathed out by God, brought into existence by the breath or the spirit of God. It is inspired, originated in God's mind, and was communicated by God's mouth to us. Therefore, it is rightly called the word of God, if that's what it says on the front of your Bible there. The mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Or as Peter stated in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. 
I wish we had all the time to go into the details of the divine nature of the Bible, the proofs that it, this is a divine book. And that's very exciting for me, okay? Because this is what changed my life when I was 18 years of age. I was doubting, and I didn't know whether what I had grown up in was true, and so this set me on a journey to look for truth. And what was empirically true about this? And just the research of this just changed my literal trajectory. But I just have time just to mention briefly three things. All right? We can be sure of the text. This is an ancient book over 2,000 years old. And so there's some question. Do we, is what we have here, was, what, was it written originally or has it changed over time? We know with 99% certainty that what you have in your hand, although it's a translation, is accurate. 99% accurate through the study of textual criticism. That if, if I could, and I can't because it's in a box in my house somewhere up in Calgary waiting to come down here, but I could pull out a Greek translation of the New Testament and a Hebrew translation of the Old Testament and show you this is what the authors would have written we can be sure of that. Second thing is we know that these are eyewitness accounts. And back in ancient time, when you had multiple eyewitness attestation to, bio, to biographical characters like Jesus and the, the characters that we have here, that we can be sure they wrote factual accounts. You have multiple eyewitness accounts here to the events that are going on in the Bible. We can be sure that these events are true. And we have archaeology backing this up. There are new discoveries made every year that show archaeologically that what we have in the Bible is true, it's accurate, and it's right. Suffice to say that what you hold in your hands are the very words of God, infallible, inerrant. God's complete revelation for your life and your salvation if you want to hear God's voice, read his word. This is God's word. And the Bible guides us to follow after God. And Paul goes on here. In the second part of uh, verse 16, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Paul goes on now to show the prophet of Scripture. It relates to both creed and conduct, to both faith and practice, to both doctrine and manner, to both belief and behavior. We have these four words here, right? We have teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. And they go together. They're, they're coupled together. For teaching and rebuking, that's about our belief. It teaches us what we should believe about God but it also rebukes us when we get off the track. If somebody comes and they tell us a false belief, this guides us to know whether it's false or true. And also, if we happen to get off track, it brings us back on track. It'll rebuke us in that way. But it also corrects and trains us in righteousness. So in our behavior, what we should be doing, it corrects us if we get off ethically on a wrong track, but it also trains us in what we should do in righteousness. Now, just a small example of this. When I was a teenager, uh, I heard that I should not have sex with anyone before I got married, all right? People, my, my parents, okay, my youth pastor said, you shouldn't do this. So people told me that I shouldn't do this, but they never told me why I shouldn't do this, all right? Thankfully, I followed their instruction, irrespective of the fact that they didn't tell me why. But then when I had to go and I had to teach this to my youth group after I was married, all right, I sat down and I started to go through this and figure out why this is true. And I just thought, this is astounding. This is amazing. This is so valuable. You know, God sets this up and he says, you know, this is why you should do this because it's an example of my faithfulness, my fidelity to you, 
And I want you to experience this same sort of thing in your relationship with your spouse. That's why I've set the boundaries around this. And I thought, this is just beautiful. Why didn't somebody tell me this ahead of time? Why didn't they train me in this righteousness in this way? And I thought this would have made it so much easier at the time. It wouldn't have made it that much easier at the time, but at least I would have understood it better, you know? Just the beauty of God's word and how he wants to train us in his ways and his righteousness. Scripture is the chief means by which God employs to bring people to himself, to understand who he is and what he calls us to do. Psalm 119, verse 105 says this, Your word, your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. Well, how does this work? Sometimes we'll be reading through God's word I don't know if you've experienced this before. We'll get a chance to do this a little later on together. But you, you just walk through the surface of the text and boom, it'll be right there. God will just be speaking to you. But sometimes it just takes some time. And we have to soak in it a little bit. We have to seep in it a little bit. We just have to meditate on the passage. And maybe God's still small voice I will come out in some way you know, guide us in this direction or correct us in this way, rebuke us in this way or train us down this path. This happened to me a, a couple of weeks ago. I was writing in my journal and I came across this uh, passage in there that talked about gentleness. It's actually the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, I, was, I was writing about this and thinking about this and God sort of tapped me on the shoulder after a bit and said, you weren't very gentle yesterday in that discussion with one of your staff members, were you? You were a little intense, weren't you? And I don't think you guys could ever imagine me as being a little bit intense in this, but I, well, I get a little intense sometimes. And God said to me, you know what? Yeah, that was a little too much intense. And I thought about it a bit, and I said, yeah, you know what? You're right. And I needed to go, and I needed to talk to that person, and I needed to say, hey, you know what? I went over the line. In my conversation there, I should have been more gentle. Can you forgive me? God's word guiding in that way. God used his word to make me a better man, to make me a better leader, to make me a more humble person. These are the powerful things that God does for us. You were never meant to live on this planet without God's word in your life. It's your lifeline. It's your instruction manual. Ronald Reagan, the former president of the United States, puts it this way. Within the covers of the Bible are answers for all the problems men face. Probably meant women as well, but at least for all the problems that we as men face, the Bible, you know, is great for this. And the invitation here from God for us is to go deeper into this. He wants you to hear his voice. This is God's word. This is God's voice to us here. God reveals himself to you in this. And God guides and directs us in this. If you want to hear God's voice, read his word. Soak in it. I remember as a teenager sitting in church and looking up on the stage and seeing, seeing my pastor preaching up there and thinking, man, I wish I knew the Bible like that guy did. You know, because then I could win all the Bible trivia games, right? <laughs> that was my thought process then. I was competitive back then as well. And uh, I, I started to read the Bible. And I remember right at the beginning, you know, just going to the, to the, the book of Proverbs. That's 31 chapters. And so just started reading through there. One chapter every day. And then once I got over the fact that you're allowed to write in your Bible, then I, I was able to, you know, just underline the verses that stuck out to me. And that's how it started for me. I started reading the Bible, you know, a chapter a day, a little bit a day. And then I, 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 I got the opportunity to go to Bible school for a while. And then I remember going to seminary. While I was in Bible school, I, I, I started to learn how to read the Bible in the original languages, Greek. And then I went to seminary and I took, you know, another four semesters of Greek. And I started taking Hebrew there as well. And by the time I got about six semesters into Greek, I remember in my last semester there, 
My professor, uh, Dr. Robert Yarborough, made this statement. He said, um, you know what? If you just knew the Bible in English, you could get about 85 to 90% of it in English. And I'm there, and my mind was just blown right there when he said that. Because I'm like, why have I spent all this money and all this time learning Greek if I can get, you know, 85, 90% by doing that? Bad news for me, good news for all of you guys here. We can get to know God's word just by reading it. Just by reading what he's given us here. By listening to it. And this is catalytic to our walk with God. No matter where you're at in your walk with him. You might be here today and you might not even believe in Jesus. But if you start just reading this word a little bit here, it's going to be catalytic to your spiritual growth. Maybe you're just starting the pathway, just walking in. I just encourage you, just spend time reading God's word. It's going to be catalytic to your spiritual growth. Maybe you've been in this for a while. You'll need to go a little deeper. You'll need to read and start to think and meditate on this. And some of us here have been doing this for decades. But as we go into God's word, as we think deeply with him, as we soak in this, God is going to use it to transform our lives as well. No matter where you're at, the words of God are going to come into your life. Be useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. But we have to go down deep into it. If we want to hear God's voice, we have to read his word. I read this in a devotional a couple of weeks ago. But what does God want us to hear most? He, want us to, he wants us to hear this good news. You aren't the mistakes that you make. You aren't the labels that have been put on you. You aren't the lies that the enemy has tried to sell you. You are who God says you are. You are a child of God. You're the apple of God's eye. You're sought after. You're more than a conqueror. You're a new creation in Christ. You are the righteousness of Christ. Our identity issues are fundamental misunderstandings of who God is. Guilt issues are misunderstanding of God's grace. Control issues are a misunderstanding of God's sovereignty. Anger issues are a misunderstanding of God's mercy. Pride issues are a misunderstanding of God's greatness. Trust issues are a misunderstanding of God's goodness. If you struggle with any of those issues, it's time to let God be the loudest voice in your life. God doesn't love you because of who you are. God loves you because of who he is. God is love. When we succeed, God says, I love you. When we fail, God says, I love you. When you walk in faith, God says, I love you. When we doubt, God says, I love you, because God is love. Love is his answer to everything. There is nothing you can do to make yourself loved by him any less or any more. God is love. God wants us to hear what he is saying. He loves you eternally, and we must heed his voice. But more than this, he wants you to hear his heart. God wants to whisper to you softly, I love you. And he whispers it softly because he wants you to lean in. And as you lean in, he might whisper it even more softly, I love you so that you'll lean in further and he can whisper in your ear, I love you, and put his arms around you. 
because he loves you so much. And he wants you to know it. And he wants you to feel it. We've been deafened in our society by the voice of conformity, by the voice of criticism, by the voice of condemnation. And the side effects of this include loneliness, shame, anxiety, and stress. And the good news in the midst of this is that you not only bear God's image, but you know his voice. And you know that his voice is calling you because his voice knits you together in your mother's womb. It's his voice that ordained all your days before you came to be. It's his voice that began a good work in you and will be faithful to bring it to completion. Where is God's voice? God's voice is right here in his word. How is he leading you and talking to you? It's right here in his word. If you want to hear his voice, read his word. And we're going to spend some time just doing that right now. We're going to spend a few moments here just taking uh, some time to read God's word. And so if you want to take with me the sheet that's in your bulletin there and just pull that out, and if you're watching us on the live stream or you just need another sheet of paper, just pull out a different sheet of paper there. And you'll be able to follow along in this way. And we're going to read together from John chapter 17, verses 20 through 26. I'm just going to teach you a little way to do this. It's called divine reading, Lectio Divina. And we're going to walk through this here, and I'm going to read it out. And uh, while I read, and I'm going to read it a little bit slowly here, I'm just going to invite you to take a pen, or if you don't have a pen, there's a pencil in the seat in front of you there. And just when, as I'm reading through here, if God draws your attention to a phrase or something, just check it off there. And then we're going to take just three or four minutes of quietness after I'm done reading, and you're just going to start to write what God's been saying to you. And he'll begin to speak to you. Maybe it'll be through a word, it might be through a picture, a thought, or this passage here, and just write those things down. And then I'll read through the passage again, and then I'll just give you a moment where you can just pray and come to God and just say, God, just put this message in my heart. All right, so let's do this little practice together, just a little practicum, a little tool that we want to put in your toolbox here of how to read God's word. So I'll read through it once, just mark off where God is drawing your attention to. This is Jesus' prayer, uh, his high priestly prayer before he walks to the cross. So this is his prayer for us. Jesus says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known 
in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. So I'm going to give you two or three minutes of quietness here, and you can just write down what God brings to your mind. Meditate. I just pray that you would continue to open our ears to hear what you have to say to us and help us to obey what you're speaking to us, Lord. We trust you for your help in the midst of this. Amen. I'll read through this passage again here. You can listen or you can continue to write what God is speaking to you. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you have loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. And then I would spend some time either writing down what God had for me, what he directed me, that sort of thing if I was doing this on my own, if I was doing this with another person or a group of people, we just spend some time then sharing how God had directed us, how he had guided us in this, and what we were going to do as a result of that. So this is just a tool to put in your toolbox, a way that you can read Scripture, one of the many ways that you can do this. And so if this works for you, this is something that you can use to teach other people. It's a simple tool. I would encourage you to take it. But 
The Bible is the foundation of how we know and follow God. If you want to hear his voice, you must read his word. So take time to soak in God's word and let it change you. Amen. Thank you.